Some of you might want to come a little closer. Uh, I'd like to request that. Uh, it gets so spread out. If you take a few moments, I'll let you adjust. And the young people, you see, they're not afraid of me, so they know I don't bite, and they're closer. So feel free to come a little closer. And we'll share. If you will turn with me to Romans chapter 8, that last paragraph. Romans chapter 8, I think you all know it. We'll begin in verse 31 and we'll read to verse, verses, uh, verse 39. So Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39. It says this, What shall we then say to these things? It's an interesting question. If God be for us, who against us? He who, yea, has not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him grant us all things? Verse 33, who shall bring an accusation against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? It is Christ who has died, but rather has also, rather has been also raised up, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ, tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, according as as it is written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long. We have been reckoned as sheep for slaughter. Verse 37. But in all these things we more than conquer through him that has loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall we pray? Lord, we are so thankful for your word. We do remember your words, our spirit and life, how we need the Holy Spirit to help us this morning in our weakness. Help us, Lord, we pray for the anointing from above for the ability to speak and for the anointing from above to receive your word and for that same anointing to respond to your word. We tell you, Lord, you alone have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? We are only interested in hearing what you have to say. So we say together, with one voice, this is our prayer, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And we ask this together in the mighty name, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm sort of on a liquid diet today in preparation for a procedure in the morning. So this is my lunch, breakfast, and dinner, I think. Maybe more for in a little bit. But uh, I want to share with you from these verses at the end of Romans 8. These are uncanny, powerful verses, if you think about it. It, several months ago, I was thinking and considering the word of God, and these verses seemed to come alive to me. 
and I couldn't get away from them. Even though we've had several conferences, I know I've been in San Antonio, and we've had the family conference and shared on different things, and now the youth get to go to Toronto this week. Even with all of that, the impression, the deep impression from this closing paragraph in Romans 8 has not left me. I believe in one way this is uh, God's word to us in the form of a divine closing argument. Above everything else, I think that's what it is. I believe at the end of Romans 8, there's a break. Most of you that know the book know that. When you go to Romans 9, 10, 11, you see it starts a bit of a different subject. It deals with election, how great the election is. It deals with Israel and God's sovereignty with Israel. It deals with his sovereignty in election in bringing the Gentiles into the church through the hardness of the heart of Israel. But it concludes that God will save all Israel. What a glorious, glorious section. And then when you end the book of Romans with chapter 12 to the end. I think all of you know that section. I think it's the practical response of the Christian to this entire book. And if we miss that practical response of the Christian, then we miss everything. It's not enough to hear the word. It's not enough for the word to be spoken. The word must be responded to. And that's what the word of God is all about. So you all know in chapter 12, that famous verse, verse 1, I'm sure you can recite it. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the compassions of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your intelligent service. And other uh, other. Other uh, Bible versions we know says your reasonable service. I think most people in the world would think it's unreasonable to give yourself a living sacrifice. But the word of God is so living, so real, it demands that we do that. So if you look at Romans, I think vaguely, I mean, I know there's different breakdowns that are much more full, but you can look at the first eight chapters and then a profound ending, and then you can look at the next three chapters and you can see God's election, and then you can look at the final chapters and you see the response that he's looking for. My concern is this last uh, paragraph in Romans 8, it seems to me that it's a summary, a summing up of everything that went before it. And it seems to me, if you look at it closely, it's God's summary for his chosen. It's God's summary for his elect. It's God's case that he makes, that he was making, adjudicating all through All through the book of Romans, from chapter 1 to 8, it's that glorious closing argument in that last paragraph that gives us such astounding comfort as his own. That's the sense that I believe this last paragraph has to do with. With. Now, I don't know, I, what I, this is what I want to do. I don't know if it'll be effective, and I don't even know if you'll like it, but I pray the Lord will anoint at least portions of it. I want to bring you into the divine courtroom and have you see what God has done, and then at the end, see, you, see what he concludes with when he makes these ultimate statements. I believe that's the sense, at least, of this summary paragraph in Romans chapter 8. Now, in the legal world, closing arguments are a normal part of business. Every trial has closing argument. Every trial has an opening statement. They're far different. At the end of the trial, after all the evidence is presented, and that's chapters 1 through 8, 
All the evidence is presented for God's salvation. All the evidence is presented for God's great work. All the things he's accomplished are presented before us, laid out to the heavenly jury. And then he makes this closing argument that we read. You may not know what a closing argument is, but I'll read to you from a paper, a legal paper. It may help. It says the closing argument is a vital component of a court case. It's a summation. Here is a summation. Or summing up, that is the concluding statement of each party's counsel reiterating the important arguments to the trier of fact, often the jury, or it could be a judge. This is what a closing argument is in a court case. A closing argument occurs after the presentation of all the evidence. In other words, in those first seven, almost eight, complete with eight chapters, all the evidence is laid down. And then at the end comes that summary closing argument that God wants to leave with his elect. The opening statement is different. It's limited to what is going to happen in the case. But a closing argument is the summation of what happened. It's the last opportunity for the lawyer to convince the jury or to convince the judge. And if you cannot convince the jury and the judge in those final moments with that summary, they'll never be convinced. As a matter of fact, this same legal paper said jurors have stated through much research that the closing argument is far more impactful than many of the arguments that went before it. Many of the facts. It's an opportunity for that counsel to say, this is it and ultimately convince the judge and, or the jury. And when you end up, the one thing that all legal counsel wants to end up with is persuading the trier of fact. That's the whole aim of a closing argument. It wants to persuade the jury if it's a defense case that his defendant is not guilty. He wants to uh, uh, persuade the judge if the judge is the trier of fact, but nevertheless, the sole aim of the closing argument is to persuade. Now, it can't go unmissed in verse 38 what the apostle says. He says, for I am persuaded. This is it. What has happened? The evidence has come out so clear. The argument so concise. The work so complete the closing statement so clear that the Apostle Paul had to conclude, I am persuaded. And brothers and sisters, that's the intention of the divine closing argument in Romans 8, 31 through 39. It's only to persuade. And may the Lord help us to see uh, this, I think, in a living way. I think we know these verses, but let's see them in a living way. You can think of closing arguments. They say that there has been, in the 20th century alone, numerous cases of the century. Numerous. I, I don't know why every time a new case comes out that has some impact, it's the uh, case of the century. Uh, some of you that are quite old maybe, could remember something about the Scopes trial. It was called the case of the century. And that was all about evolution, you remember, science versus creation. And uh, the, the strange thing, people lose it, the trial was won about creation. That was the trial of the century. And then you remember the Lindbergh baby. What a catastrophe. Here you had this hero of America who flew across the ocean for the first time in his little plane and landed, I believe it was in Paris. 
And when he landed, he became a hero unlike any hero in the United States at that moment. And his baby was uh, kidnapped. You remember that? Our sister's shaking her head. She's my age probably, so understands. It was the trial of the century. But probably the one you remember the best is O.J. Simpson. It was called, without a doubt, the trial of the century. And do you know what changed that whole trial was that short closing argument of Johnny Cochran? That was the one thing. All the evidence was against O.J. Simpson. Do you guys know who O.J. Simpson is? People are shaking their heads. O.J. Simpson, number 32 of the Buffalo Bills football team, was one of the greatest running backs that ever lived. Orenthal something Simpson. He was famous. USC, I believe, he came out of. But University of Southern California for you young people. Uh, I'm not going to pick on you, I promise. But O.J. Simpson was this famous athlete. He was this darling that became a movie star. And then he, 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 he did, and all the evidence was against him, the most horrendous crime. He sliced up his ex-wife and her friend at the door to her home. Now, all the evidence was against him. And let me tell you, I'm not to try a fact, but he was dead guilty. He was completely guilty. The evidence was so overwhelming that there's no way he could have been innocent. But in that moment, that brilliant moment of closing summary, Johnny Cochran got up and he took the stocking cap and he put it on his head. He crushed it on his head. The, the, the killer stocking cap that was left at the scene. And he said these infamous words that changed the case. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Those were the words. And then he took the knife, and it was more than just a little bit. I'm falling apart here, brother. He told me I had big ears, so it worked for me. Maybe not. But then the rest of that case, you just think of it. He took that glove, and I can remember the scene. I watched it in rapt attention, and he stretched, and he pulled, and he, he, he strained, and you thought he was in a, a workout video. He was pulling and stretching. And here he is, this little, think of it, he's a smaller man than O.J. Simpson, this great athlete. But the closing argument is, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And in the power of the closing argument, with all the evidence against him, the case was won. And Orenthal Simpson, number 32, Buffalo Bills, Heisman Trophy member, great athlete, murderer, walks scot-free. That's the power of the closing argument. But brothers and sisters, the power of this closing argument in Romans 8, 31 through 39 exceeds the power of any closing argument that has ever been in any trial whatsoever, earthly or heavenly. This is the divine closing argument. This is the summation of God to his elect. This is the blessing and the comfort that he extends to those who believe. This is the grandest closing argument ever spoken. Now, consider Romans 8, 31 through 39. It's the most powerful. It's the most persuasive closing argument argument. Not only is it the most powerful and most persuasive, but it erases all doubt whatsoever. In other words, in a court 
case, in a trial, if you're the defendant, like guilty O.J. Simpson was, in a court case, the whole point is that closing argument is to produce reasonable doubt. Now, in this closing argument, the point is not to produce reasonable doubt, but it's to produce living faith. That's the difference. There's no doubt in this closing argument, you read it. We are being defended by God. God is our defender. God is our lawyer. And we're being so skillfully defended that every instance of doubt should be erased from the believer's mind. That's the power of this closing argument. I I would like to just maybe read to you just a few moments of what some others have said about these verses. This brother Newell uh, who wrote a book, I know it's one of Steve Sheridan's favorites, verse by verse in Romans. He put together a few thoughts from different ones that talked about the importance of these verses the power of these verses. And he mentioned a brother named Bingle. And Bingle said, I think it's profound, he said, of these verses, we can no farther go, think, or wish. What a powerful statement. Think of other ones. Another said, the profound and colossal character of thought is within these verses. Another one said this, this whole passage to verse 34 and even to the end of the chapter strikes all thoughtful interpreters and readers as transcending almost every language. That's a strong word. In other words, there's no language like it. I think it is the consummate end of all of God's work. One brother called it the magnificent climax. Think of it. Have you ever been to an orchestra? Now, I'm not so refined, and I've only been to a few orchestras, by the way. I remember watching them in the fifth grade. They put us all in the bus and haul us off, and we have to listen to the orchestra. I was pretty much amazed at all the symphony working together and all the music and all the instruments in coordination. But when it got to the climax, when the end, when that music rose to its last, in crescendo in that orchestra everybody stood on their feet and cheered and I thought I must be at a sporting event this is the climax of Romans 8 31 through 39 the music has risen in crescendo the work of God is so perfectly presented the power of God to save to sanctify, to seal is so evident that at the end it's a crescendo and a climax like nothing else before and nothing else since. Well, the style of Romans, this Romans 8, 31 to 39, you may have noticed it. It's full of questions. It's all questions. Look at all the things that look like statements. In fact, they're questions with a question mark at the end. It's quite an effective manner in closing arguments. You remember what you're trying to do if you have a defendant is just raise enough doubt, just like the enemy did in the Garden of Eden. And he said, has God said? He was a skillful lawyer, the enemy. He knew if he could just put reasonable doubt in the minds of those hearers, this new creation of God, man, he knew he had won the battle. But this is a series of questions, and it's not to raise doubt. There's no doubt whatsoever when you read these verses, yet it's a very 
very effective style. I say it like this. These are the greatest questions that answer all of our questions. I say it like this. These are questions that give the answers to all. If we understand these questions, if we can take them in, if we can assimilate them, if they can become part of us, they will be so transforming in their nature that they will answer all of our questions. So it seems paradoxical. These are questions, but they answer all of our questions. Well, That's the long introduction for the series. I don't know how many messages. It may be, it will certainly be three. It may be four. I don't know. And whenever, we'll share. But today, we're going to look at these first two verses. And today, we're going to look at just three things. First of all, there's the unexplained question right out of the box. It doesn't seem we know exactly what it's talking about. The second thing is we get the ultimate assurance. And brothers and sisters, if we as believers can lay hold of this ultimate assurance, it will be life-changing in its scope. And just like OJ went free, we will go free forever in the Lord Jesus. And thirdly, we want to just consider the unspeakable gift That's what it's about. So I hope maybe some of this will have some meaning as we go through it. First of all, the unexplained question. Listen to the way it starts. What shall we we then say to these things? What shall we then say to these things? Think about it. What things is he talking about? It seems to me on the surface to be an unexplained question. What things is he referring to? Is it the whole book, Romans 1 through 8? Is it the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation? Is it just the immediate that deals with the glorification of the saints and the purpose of God in chapter 8 that directly preceded it? What is this unexplained question? I believe that's important. And I believe what Paul is referring to is all eight chapters that preceded it. He's looking at the case of God for man. And he's concluding at the end in rapt attention, what shall we then say to these things? All these things. From Romans 1 verse 1 to Romans chapter 8 verse 30, this is what he's talking about. It's all of these things. And this is what the unexplained questions uh, are all about. He's looking at the entire glorious masterpiece from Romans 1 through Romans 8. And in this glorious masterpiece are presented the hues of the gospel in the grandest form that they've ever been presented. If you're going to understand the good news of Jesus Christ, if you're going to understand the gospel of God, you have to consider the book of Romans. Nowhere like Romans is the gospel of God so clearly uh, presented. Look at chapter 1. We'll go to the beginning. Verse 1. Paul, bondman of Jesus Christ, a called apostle, separated to God's glad tidings, which he had before promised by his prophets in holy writings, And listen to verse 3, concerning his son, come of David's seed according to the flesh. What is being presented here is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ concerns only one thing. It concerns his son. And in his son, everything else is included. That's the story and the introduction 
to Romans. And, in, and we know these verses in verses uh, 16 and 17 in the same chapter. For I am not ashamed of the glad tidings, for it is God's power to salvation to everyone that believes, both to the Jew first and to Greek. For righteousness of God is revealed therein on the principle of faith to faith, according as it is written, but the just shall live by faith. This is the subject of the book of Romans. It is the gospel that Paul is not ashamed of. It is concerning Jesus Christ. And this is what he tells us this whole book has to deal with. And then in general, if you looked at the rest of the book, you discover that God has a dilemma. Now, you don't think of God as having a dilemma. He's that uncreated being that made everything. He's the one who is before all, and by him all things consist. He is the one that is over all. He is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is deity. He is God. You know, when people argue to me, argue with me, and they often do, about what is it about God? I say, he is God. That's it. What more do you need to know? If he is God, that settles it. That settles the whole argument. That is the closing argument. He is God. Well, he has a dilemma. Because you see, he purposed in his heart, as we so eloquently heard from our brother Stephen Kong at the family conference, to use man, this low created being, to bring everything unto the feet of the Lord Jesus. That's what God, this sovereign God, this almighty God, determined in his heart. What a dilemma. And he was going to use this low being, made a little lower than the angels, to in the end defeat this high being, Satan, and bring everything under the feet of Jesus. That's the purpose of God. And so a dilemma arose. It didn't take long with man for a dilemma arose. When that enemy, that legal genius, walked into the garden and said, does God say? They were overthrown and didn't know what to believe and reasonable doubt filled their being. And then all of a sudden, you know the story, they sinned. And God has a dilemma of sins. How is he going to use you and me and you to bring Satan under his feet when he has such a dilemma about sins? It seems impossible. I would have thought if I were God, and I'm not, and you're so thankful for that. I would have thought he would have said, that's it. One strike and you're out. He would have given up, and he would have gone to plan B, and he would have said there has to be a different way. Man will never do it. There's not a hope that man will rise to the occasion and be used by me in my eternal purpose to overcome Satan and bring everything to the feet of Jesus. It's not possible. He has this dilemma of sins. So what does he do? Does he give up? I would have given up. He never gave up. Brothers and sisters, that's the encouragement of Romans. He didn't give up. He saw us when we fell into sin. And Romans concludes in such graphic detail in those early chapters that Jew and Gentile alike are under sin. You know the verse, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. This is the dilemma God has. I think you know that verse. Um, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But listen, thank God that verse doesn't stop there. 
If it stopped there, it would be over. It would be over for you and me. And the word would be ever written upon you guilty. But then it says this in glorious tone. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth a mercy seat through faith in his blood for the showing forth of his righteousness in respect of the passing by the sins that had taken place before through the forbearance of God, for the showing forth of his righteousness in the present time. Listen to this, so that he should be just and justify him that is of the faith of Jesus Christ. This was the great work of God. Sins here is plural. God had a dilemma. If it were you or if it were me, you know you would have given up. You would have looked to some other way. But God didn't look to another way. In his mercy, he sent his son to die to forever take away sins once and for all. That is what this verse is hearkening back to when it says, what shall we then say to these things? These are overwhelming things. What can you say? That God who should have given up was right to give up, was reasonable to give up, should have, yet didn't. And in his mercy, he did the unspeakable. He gave his only son for your sins and my sins. I believe that's the first dilemma God faced. Look at Romans 5, verse 10. It says... For if we being enemies, we have been reconciled to God through the death of his son, much rather having been reconciled, we shall be saved in the power of his life. Brothers and sisters, he saved his enemies. I often think in John, those closing words, again, that closing argument of the Lord to his disciples. You know in John 14 to 17, those beautiful closing words, when he said, greater love hath no man than this, that one should lay his life down for his friends. I believe that's a very good definition. I think you will agree. It's the highest definition of love. But think of this. Think of this. He didn't just lay his life down for his friends. His own definition of the greatest love, but he laid down his life for even his enemies. He exceeded his own definition of greatest love. That's what he did when he took sins away. That's what it means. What shall we say then? To these things. That's the opening verse. Or consider another dilemma that God has with sin itself, singular, not plural. You you see, some people, and most of you probably know, we sin because we're sinners. You know that. There's this argument always. Another argument man makes, well, they're good people. Every sinner sins. Every sinner sins. This is the dilemma. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It comes out of us. It's natural. I look at my grandchildren and I love them to pieces. But some of the things that come out of them, I'm convinced of the truth of God's word of the old Adam. It seems to me that this is a dilemma God has. There's something corrupt in man that he has to deal with. He has to face. It's not just that we've committed these sins and if he can take care of the past, everything is solved. 
He has another dilemma which seems to be more impossible to overcome than forgiving the past. What do you do with a sinner? What do you do with the one whose nature is wrong? And in Romans 6, there is brilliance. There is divine brilliance because what he does for the sinner, what he does for sin singular, is he takes you and me to the cross in the Lord Jesus and we read those glorious words that we know that we have been crucified with Christ. You, believe it or not, and you may not like this, you certainly won't like this about your children, are nothing but a sin factory. Some of you are more productive than others. But you are but a sin factory. So God has to deal not only with sins, he has to deal with sin. And when he deals with sin, his way to deal with sin is take the factory and put it out of business. Do you get it? I think that's a good business plan. I think that's a great business plan. Take the sin machine and pull the power plug. That's the secret. So when you read Romans 6, you discover this is exactly what God did. He nullified the sinner. He took the sinner to the cross. He nailed the sinner to the cross and he took the sinner to the grave and he took the sinner with him in resurrection and now that sinner is raised in newness of life and the power of sin need no longer have dominion over him. That's the glory of the book of Romans. That is what the Apostle Paul means. What shall we then say to these things? It seems almost too glorious. So that's a second dilemma. And then there's a third dilemma, believe it or not, that's addressed in Romans. It's chapter 7 of Romans. Paul the Apostle makes this tremendous discovery that few believers ever discover. He discovered that not only were there sins in the past that need to be dealt with, not only was there the sin nature that needed to be dealt with, but there was some other problem. And that other problem is self that was manifested in the flesh. And you know the words, you know the verses, how he said, I have discovered that in my flesh good does not dwell. What a dilemma. What a dilemma. This goes beyond sins. This goes beyond sin. This goes to the very makeup of man. And what God does in his greatest work is take sin to the cross, take self to the cross, and that we can begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and put to death self. That's why the message of the cross needs to be repeated more and more in the church today. People think the message of the cross is so cruel. They say, we don't want to talk about the cross. We'll talk about the substitutionary work for sins. We'll talk about the inclusive work of the cross, Romans chapter 6, for the sin nature. But we don't want to talk about the voluntary part of the cross where we're told if we're going to be his disciple, what must we do? Take up our cross and follow him. What is the theme of the conference? Deny yourself. Do you suppose that's what he's talking about in Romans 7? I suppose that's exactly what the Apostle Paul... And so he cries out in wretched pain. He says, what shall I do with this body of death? The self-life is a body of death. And unless you take up your cross and follow him, Unless you take this ultimate provision of the Holy Spirit abiding in you and living in you, because that's the other part 
of the battle. And that Holy Spirit wars against the flesh, which is the manifestation of self. You'll never come into this liberated position being liberated from self. And all you have to do is look at Satan and see the power of self. I believe it's a message not spoke about much. I believe it's a message we see. And then there's another thing, if that weren't enough. What shall we then say to these things? When you look at the very end of Romans 8, 28 through 30, we'll turn to those verses. You know these verses. This is just before our text. But we do know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, because whom he has foreknown, he is also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he should be the firstborn among many brethren. But whom he has predestinated... These also he has called, and whom he has called, these also he has justified. But whom he has justified, these also he has glorified. Brothers and sisters, this is the wonder of these things. Not only did God save you from sins, not only did God save you from sin, not only does God make provision to save you from self, but in the end he makes this unbelievable statement that the purpose of God is to conform you to the very image of the Lord Jesus. He didn't reject us in his purpose. He did a consummate work and brought us to the place that we can fulfill his purpose. This is what it means. What shall we say then to these things? I think we ought to fall in worship when we look at God's work in his plan. I think our only response can be Romans 12, verse 1. I think we can wonder that why we weren't disqualified, why we weren't found guilty and left guilty, how the mercies of God have been poured out upon us in unimaginable depth that we should be called the very elect of God. Our response ought to be one of worship. There's another thing. I think in this verse 31, we see the ultimate assurance. Now, you've read this verse many times, but do we know this verse? It says, if God be for us, think of that. That's the ultimate assurance. Now, here's where I think people stumble. It's in a question form. So all that looks in the page, if you look at the page, you see the if in type 32 text, and you see God for us in size 7 text. And you begin to say, if, is God for me? Maybe he's not for me. Maybe he's not. Many believers say, I don't believe. I've heard believers say to me, to my face, "Come, I don't believe God is for me. What a tragedy. This is God's divine closing argument. If God be for you, who then against you? That's the ultimate case. That's what he brings us to. And that's what we as believers need to lay hold of in a living way. Let me tell you, dear brothers and sisters, write it on the front leaf of your Bible. Write it there that every time you open the word of God, you read God for us. Write it upon your mirror so that when you get up in the morning, and you, Linda might shoot me, but maybe I'll just do it. When you get up in the morning, you see it the first thing in the morning. And when you go to bed at night, you see this ultimate assurance. God is for us. But more importantly, write it. Let the Holy Spirit write it upon the pages of your heart. 
So many Christians live in a spirit of condemnation. They still live as if they were under their sins that he so completely dealt with. They live as if they're under their sin that he so completely dealt with. They live as if there's no safe harbor from self that he's made every provision to deal with. They live as if their life has no purpose whatsoever. And they've been called and saved for the very purpose of God. Listen to these verses. If God be for us. Now I like what Newell says. And I know Brother Steve's a student of Newell. He says the if shouldn't be if. And I happen to agree with that. He says the if really should be since. And if you read it in that way, you get a fuller view of what this argument is. Since God is for us, who against us? That to me is one of the most glorious glorious and ultimate assurance in the word of God. It's in black and white. Notice that it is the first argument in the closing argument. If we as believers can't lay hold of this singular fact that in this lifetime, even when we were created, even when we were enemies, even when we were sinners, even when we were under the power of sin, even when we were under self-domination, that God is for us. If we can't lay hold of it, we will never triumph in Christ. This is why I think this is the most important assurance than we can have. Never forget it. I often call, I say, I've said this before, you've heard me say this before, I often call people up and talk to them about things, news events and these, but what, just what, if you called up a brother and sister and you said, Brother John, Sister Sue, do you know God is for us? Think how the revelation of that, if it entered into our very spiritual being, would transform our communion with God, would transform our fellowship with one another, would transform the expression of the fullness of Christ as we meet together, if God be for us. Since God be for us, this to me is the greatest, the greatest of all, I believe, assurances in the Bible. This is fact. This is not wishful thinking. We say, oh, I I just somehow wish that God would be for me. I think that's the way believers think. I think that's the way the one talent uh, saint who buried his treasure thought. He said, you know, you are a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow. He had a wrong understanding of God. The glorious closing argument and the absolute ultimate assurance is God is for us. End of story. It is the first thing that's brought up. May we lay hold of that. It will erase all doubt. Now, the second thing about that, if God be for us, who against us? Think about it. God has no natural enemies. Now, you may say, brother, you may want to call me on the carpet and say, brother, the Satan is God's Natural enemy. And in one sense, I would agree. But in another sense, I'm not sure, and I'm willing to be corrected, if it ever outrightly says directly in Scripture, Satan is God's enemy. It says to Peter said to the disciples, your adversary goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. 
It says, the Apostle Paul says, a door has been opened to me wide, an effectual door, and the adversaries many. We have adversaries. But listen to this. I do know what Satan wants to destroy all that God has done. I'm not uh, fooled about that. But in a sense, we can say God has no enemies. Who can be God's enemy? Would you like to be God's enemy? Would you like to take on the Most High? God knows that he could say one word to Satan. And Satan would be done forever. And often we think, why didn't he do it? But instead, he came up with this remarkable purpose that he would choose you and me. And somehow this weaker vessel would be used to destroy our arch enemy. Isn't that amazing? If God be for us, who can be against us. You know, there's some animals that they say have no real natural enemies. They're sort of uh, the king of their species. And this is not a zoology lecture, but they call them apex predators. They have no natural enemies. They don't walk about in fear. They don't live in fear. Now, they make it clear there are enemies even for these natural uh, creatures that have some, uh, no so-called natural enemy. There is bacteria. There is disease. They do even have enemies. But if you think about it, God has no enemies. And the ultimate assurance is this, since God is for us, who against us? That's the assurance. To me, that's so glorious. When I think of my weakness, how easily I'm overwhelmed and overcome, surely the enemy just blows upon me and I'm down and out. But when I think of the ultimate assurance that God is for us, and therefore, if he is for us, who against us? What hope rises even in my heart? This is the ultimate assurance. Praise the Lord for that ultimate assurance. There's another thing we should think about when we look at these first two verses. We need to think about uh, there's, there's this unspeakable gift that we have. Unspeakable gift. Listen to this. Turn back to our text. He who, yea, that word I'm emphasizing for a reason, has not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him grant us all things? He who, yea, has not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Brothers and sisters, This is the unspeakable gift, his son. And this is the unequaled proof of God being for us. You know, we make love a very cheap word. We we just say, well, brother, I love you. I've done it many times. Sister, I love you. Oh, I love this. I love peanut butter and chocolate. We love every, it's a cheap word. There's no cost. There's no price that was paid. Think of it, it's just a term. But God and the Bible always prove their love. That's the difference. When you read, when you read uh, for, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and you look at verse 24, it's on the grace of giving. Paul exhorts the church, he says, show therefore to them before the assemblies the proof of your love and of our boasting about you. Brothers and sisters, God's unequaled proof of his love is giving his only begotten son. Can you think of greater proof? Can you imagine greater proof? 
He could have easily sent a stand-in, it would seem to me, in my darkened thinking. He could have easily sent an angel. But no. Can you imagine? I, I don't know what it was like at that moment in the eternal councils when the Godhead was fellowshipping and God the Father was sharing with God the Son along with God the Holy Spirit. And in that incredible moment, they came up with this eternal plan to say, we will send Jesus, the only begotten of God, and he will be the proof, the ultimate proof, forever, the unequaled proof, forever that God is for us. That was what God did. It seems to me you would think would be so unreasonable, so over the top. How could God do such a thing? I think of Genesis 22, the story about Abraham and Isaac. And you know the story quite well. It says in verse 2 to Abraham, who is representative of the Father, God the Father, take thine son, thine only son, and offer him upon the mountains a, a sacrifice, a burnt offering. In the mountains I will show you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Dutifully, Abraham went to that man. Dutifully, he laid Isaac upon the altar. Dutifully, he laid the wood upon Isaac. He was about to sacrifice his only son. And then dutifully, Abraham raised that knife without hesitation. And he was about to plunge the knife into the heart of his only son. And the heavens broke open, and the angel of the Lord, who's the Lord Jesus himself, said, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the boy. I often think of that. He didn't extend that same courtesy to the son of his love. Think of it. Think of the unequal proof. That knife that was raised at Calvary was plunged deeply into the heart of our Lord Jesus. It was withheld with Isaac, forbade by, to Isaac. But we read those words that are beyond human comprehension in Isaiah, yet it pleased the Father to crush him. That's the unequaled proof. That's the unspeakable gift. How can you imagine that, that hymn I often refer to, How Great Thou Art? You know that hymn. I've, you're probably tired of me referring to it. It's number six in our book. It was made famous by George Beverly Shea who sung it, sang it. My, wife, my wife's always telling me I can't keep those two words straight. Let me try. See if George Beverly Shea, I'm going to really try hard, sang it. Is that right? That's right. First time in 63 years I've probably gotten it right. He sang it 99 times at the New York Revival, Billy Graham. And America became introduced to this song. And this song, I often pray this. It says, And when I think of God, that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. When I think of God his son not sparing. It's the unspeakable gift. It's the unequaled proof. We sung that song, that hymn. It is one of my favorite hymns. Ruth and Cousins hymn, O Christ, what burdens bow thy head. Listen to this verse. Jehovah bade his sword awake. O Christ, it woke against thee. 
Thy blood the saints flaming blade must slake. Thy heart its sheath must be. All for my sake, my peace to make. Listen to this. Now sleeps that sword for me. God is for you. He has done the unspeakable, most unreasonable, the most illogical thing he could do when he gave his only son to be delivered up for us all. And now for you, he calls you his elect and blesses you and assures you with his over-the-top assurances. I believe this is what it's speaking of. You know, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15 says, Thanks be to God for his unspeakable free gift. Don't you think it's unspeakable? Can you ever doubt that God is for us? Will you ever say if, like there's some question? It seems to me to be the ultimate assurance. One said this, giving us his best, his all, even Christ, shall he give us his dear son, and then hold back trifles. Listen to the rest of this verse in 32. But delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him grant us all things? Brothers and sisters, not only does he give his all, his best, his only son, but in his son he gives us all things. Everything we need. That's the closing argument. He says you will no longer need anything because you have my one and only son. I believe it's Colossians 3 verse 11 that says, but Christ is everything and in all. Darby says that word everything means all things. How, this is the closing argument, how shall he not with with him grant us all things? Well, this is the closing argument. May the Lord encourage us. I think this is an enormous Word. You think about, Paul could have stopped at verse 30 with the purpose of God. Paul could have stopped writing at verse 30. But yet the Holy Spirit knew there was one final note that must be hit, that had to be hit, one final argument that had to be spoken so that the called of God, the elect of God, may forever have no doubt whatsoever. And here the Holy Spirit hits that high note. This is Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we then say to these things? Think about that. Meditate on that phrase when you go home. What shall we then say to these things? Since God be for us, who against us? He who yea, the word actually means even. He who even. King James Version somehow left that word out. The American Standard Version somehow left that little word out. Darby translated it yea. He who even gave his only begotten son 
how will he not with him grant us all things? Lord, we commit to you this word. We're praying you open our eyes. We're praying that the Holy Spirit would breathe upon these thoughts and grant us to see as we've never seen what your word says. Quicken us by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we know we're dependent. We want this to be our assurance. We want this to be our song. We want this to be our delight. We want this to be that which transforms and turns around our life as a believer. Write these words upon our heart. Write them deeply. And may the Holy Spirit continually remind us that above everything else, God is for us. We ask this together in the name of Jesus. Amen.